My name is Chris Collier. I'm the Executive Director of Renew Theatres, which manages the Ambler County Highway and Garden Theatres. And one of the great things that is wonderful about this series is because we're virtual, it allows us to invite participants from all of our theaters uh, to be part of these conversations. Um, so really excited to have all of you from across uh, the Philadelphia and Princeton area. And sometimes we actually have some participants outside of our immediate geographic area. So welcome to anyone uh, joining us. Um, this program is sponsored by the Vesta Fund, which allows us to make this program free to our members. So I just wanted to say thank you and welcome to all of our members who are joining us uh, through this extended closure period. Uh, members like all of you have been so important to keeping our theaters alive and running through this period. So thank you so much uh, to those of you who are members and supporters of our organizations. Um, just a couple quick things about um, the Zoom protocols here. Uh, first off, we request that everyone remain on mute until you are talking. And normally what we can do, uh, we're just about uh, 20 or so people, is if you do have a question, um, you can unmute and ask it. I feel if we start to step on each other's toes and get in each other's way, we can uh, revert to raising hands or using the chat feature. Um, but ideally, we'd like to have this be an open discussion. So we'll start with just uh, everyone speaking. And then if we need to organize that in a different way, we will handle that as we move forward. Um, this is a discussion. So I know that our host will um, share some, some insights about the film, but then open things up. So I do encourage people to, uh, to share your thoughts and to, to join in the conversation. Tonight, we are joined by Maria Di Bautista, um, who's a professor at, of English and comparative literature at Princeton University. Um, she specializes in 20th century literature and film, uh, especially the European novel and narrative theory. Um, there's a handful of books that she's written on Virginia Woolf, um, but knowing the topic of tonight's discussion, I would highly recommend all of you checking out her title, Fast Talking Dames. Uh, which is all about uh, films from this era. Now I know I see a lot of familiar faces. I know that there are a lot of you joining us who are also on last week and who have been on a lot of our other film 101 discussions. I have met, let Maria know that we did watch The Thin Man last week. So a lot of us are up on our Powell and Loy uh, history. Um, so I hope that uh, with another Powell and Loy film, and especially uh, with some other romantic interests uh, mixed in, that there will be a lot to discuss. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. I'm now happy to turn things over to Maria. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And um, good evening, everybody. It's really nice to see you and get a chance um, to talk to you about a couple of films among them. Is the it many. possible that Maria could voice up a little bit? Voice up. Thank you. Please. Yep. How's this? Is that better? Better? Okay. Better? Oh, everyone can hear me? You know, it's really, it's, it's funny because I don't know how well I come across. Um, so if you can't hear me, just go like this or signal me somehow, okay? Um, okay, well, I just wanna say again, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me and um, asking me really to come up with a couple of, of films that I thought might see us through this holiday season that um, is bleaker than we've encountered in, in, in a lot of time. So one of the reasons I put these two films together, uh, this week, Libel Lady, and uh, next week, The Lady Eve, is to bring some sort of cheer to the, to the holiday season, uh, but also to remind us if we need reminding or to introduce us if we don't know this period very well in American film that uh, during the 30s and early 40s, American cinema was at its peak, but I think really the kind of consummate genre that emerged was um, American comedies, particularly screwball comedies, which gave uh, particularly women a kind of new chance um, and a unique chance uh, to uh, represent themselves in a particularly modern way. Now, the reason I chose Libel Lady 
uh, is because one of the one of the things that becomes obvious when you watch films from this era is that you have a lot of heroines. Thirty. Damn. What? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Got it. You have a lot of uh, screen heroines who are very modern, very resourceful, very sort of engaging, very charming, know pretty much what they want, um, but they cause a little of social unease and anxiety. And so Libel Lady is really a way of sort of maybe focusing initially on how the women, particularly in these films, um, face a question about their reputation, okay? Um, in this film tonight, Myrna Loy plays an heiress who has a reputation for being an international playgirl, which we learn in the course of the film is absolutely opposite to the kind of person she is. Um, this gives the a film uh, the chance in some sense to explore a figure that was very much at the, at the heart of screwball comedies and perhaps in the national consciousness in the 30s, eras of the Great Depression, and that is the heiress, the figure of the heiress who has a lot of money, um, very willful, sometimes doesn't know uh, what to do with her life. And many of you probably know the screwball comedy that actually set off the craze, which was It Happened One Night, of uh, Claudette Colbert, uh, Clark Gable. Um, what I like about tonight's um, uh, discussion um, of, this, of this film is that actually it gives us not one, but two couples, two screwball couples. So it's a kind of cornucopia. I thought we should double our pleasure tonight. Uh, usually screwball comedies or romantic comedies revolve around a triangle of some sort. There's usually uh, a girl or sometimes a guy, but usually a sort of girl, an heiress or someone in a, in a kind of open position uh, who has to choose between two mates one who is steady, respectable, or somehow fits into some kind of conventional category, and then the one that she really, um, that really gets her heart uh, beating faster, and who we know from the very beginning is the one she's fated to be with. Well, here we have two couples, um, and they're played by really incomparable stars, and that's why I wanted to start out by showing that kind of opening clip that has really nothing to do with the movie, but is, it, is the way the movie actually welcomes us in, into itself. Um, and what I love about that scene is these four sterling actors just sort of striding confidently, very happily to the future. Um, a really, I think, positive image in the 1930s where it wasn't quite sure where people um, were going. Um, so I'd be interested tonight in, in hearing your uh, reactions uh, not only to the couples themselves, and they obviously align uh, very, uh, I think, very directly and explicitly along class lines. There's the Myrna Loy, William Powell couple. She's the heiress, he's the debonair uh, style. In fact, the film is always sort of referring to him as being subtle or as refined. At one point, Gladys uh, uh, um, Harlow says, technique, why can't you be as subtle as him, uh, to uh, Spencer Tracy, who plays, uh, again, another stock figure in 30s comedies, the newspaper man, the kind of hard scrabble um, newspaper man who'll do anything to go after a story. So you, you, have, you have here this, uh, uh, I don't know, volatile situation. Situation is 1930s America, tabloid journalism, celebrity cultures on the run, um, on the rise. Uh, an heiress who's attracting public attention very much, a kind of prelude to our own celebrity culture, newspaper that finds itself in a pickle because they've uh, produced false news, we would say today, okay? Um, something that, that wasn't true, a mistake, and now they're going to have to pay for it. So one couple is really uh, uh, around this, I would say, nexus of, of money and, and power. The newspaper is a different kind of power. And there we have Spencer Tracy um, really at his um, devilish best, I think, paired with Jean Harlow. Um, hard scrabble, as, I, as I, I like to sort of characterize them. Um, Harlow to me in the end is uh, the more fascinating and interesting character. She seems always to be sidelined, pushed aside, uh, always wanting to get married and, and literally kind of often um, pushed out the door, neglected. It's one of the, um, I would say, disturbing undertones of the film. But I think what makes these comedies uh, so gripping, but also in some sense, um, 
uh, so resonant is that they're not afraid to sort of confront the issues that their very material um, makes us aware of. Uh, so we have class divisions, um, rich and poor, uh, an heiress who seems to have uh, one sort of fabulous outfit after another, and $5 million is just like a drop in the bucket to her. And the Gladys Jean Harlow character, clearly lower class, raised on true romance magazines, trying to find a place for herself in the world. And then these two men um, uh, sort of exchanging couples sort of uh, all through. So uh, I'd be interested in seeing uh, how you think about the pairings that the, the film pre prepares us with and um, the issues uh, that it raises. I think the issues uh, outside of sort of class divisions, the discrepancy in wealth, um, uh, what it means um, to have money or not to have money, particularly in the 1930s, but also issues I think of what actually makes a marriage. Um, I think this is really um, important. Um, the libel suit is about a woman who supposedly breaks up a marriage. Gladys wants to get married. It's a kind of running gag that she keeps <laughs> she keeps coming back. She's got this. Um, She's got this wedding dress. At one point, Tracy says to her, you know, turn in your wedding dress and get us a straight jacket. And you feel, gosh, are those, are the, those, those are the two alternatives really in this screwball farce that, that, uh, that we're watching. At another point, when Gladys uh, doesn't want to sort of give up her, her husband, uh, Myrna Lloyd tells her, well, you don't want to build a marriage on spite, okay? So, the, but there's also the question of bigamy, which is rolled into the plot. Um, there's a lot of marrying and remarrying. Um, what is divorce? What is the place of divorce in American culture at this time? So you see that even though it seems to be lighthearted, it's really, I think, pointing at issues that um, the audience of the day perhaps uh, are struggling with directly or in the periphery of their lives or at least are aware of, but is presented in them to, in a way um, that doesn't seem threatening and maybe sort of suggesting um, some solutions. Um, I'd also be, so I'd, like to hear you on, on, on some of these issues, some of others you've picked up, your reaction to the stars. And then finally, um, I guess, uh, talk about the ending because it is not as clean and neat as a lot of screwball endings are. Um, it ends in a kind of cacophony, people trying to explain. It's like you've made a muddle, you can't really muddle your way out of it, can you? Um, and, I guess for me, the, the line that, that keeps coming back, and again, because I guess I'm an advocate in the end for, for Jean Harlow, Gladys, who really died um, so sadly. This is 1936, she died the next year. Um, uh, she was engaged to Powell. I, I, uh, Chris, I think you said last week, you talked about uh, sort of Powell and Lloyd. They were a screen couple. They were great friends in, in real life, but they never had a romantic attachment. But Powell and and um, and Jean Harlow were in fact engaged to be married, but they ne they never were married because she died um, before that before that could happen. Um, as she was finishing her 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 last film, um, Saratoga. Um, but at the very end of the film, she has it's really a kind of it's a, it's both a sort of a, a, a funny and an odd and poignant line where Tracy is sort of leaving, realizing that the suit has been dropped. And Myrna Loy says, you've forgotten something. And a kind of running gag is they're always forgetting their hats and going back for it. You may have noticed that when they go to the Long Island. And you think, well, why are they doing this? It's just a running gag. But I think it's to set up that last time he forgets his hat in that hotel room, picks up his hat. And she's, she, he says, oh, yeah, thank you, picks up the hat. And of course, it's Gladys who he's left. Um, and when, she's, when she says to, to, to them, you know, you were all geared up for a happy ending, but I'm here, I'm here now and I'm not going away. Um, that, that kind of stance, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of drawing a line in the uh, uh, sand, but I also think it gives us a sense of the story actually she's carried into the film all along. Um, and this is, uh, this is her time to kind of, um, uh, finally sort of have her say. So I'd be interested what you think about um, uh, the, the companionability of the film, the, the way these stars seem to obviously have such a great time together and the rapport, um, no matter how you mix them up is so great, whether they're, uh, whether they're in a scene together or even when Loy and Spencer Tracy are sort of talking to each other, you can, you can see um, that there's a, a certain kind of uh, chemistry that is being um, 
uh, uh, generated there, that the film is just uh, very happily um, uh, uh, exploiting. On the other hand, these combustible combina combinations, as I said, leads to a sort of situation that may not be, um, it may not be as sort of soothing and reassuring as uh, we expect um, romantic comedies, but actually uh, screwball comedies to be. It ends in a marriage, uh, but a marriage that still has to be sorted out. So on that note, just what needs to be sorted out, a film that um, is about all kinds of confusions and deceptions, um, uh, how, how these can be untangled at the end and yet what remains um, yet to be uh, yet to be sorted out, not in the film, but perhaps in the audience's mind and perhaps in society itself. So that's how I just wanted to sort of set it up. Um, and um, now I just kind of, uh, I guess, sort of open it up to you, your, your, your reactions to the film or what struck you, uh, particularly if this is the first time for you or if, if you're a repeated um, watcher of films from this era, what struck you as as kind of original or engaging or fetching um, about the film or any one of its stars. Looks like Sharon is raising her hand. Sharon? Yes. So can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sharon. Hi, I'm Maria. What I thought was interesting about this movie um, is, you know, the whole idea of marriage throughout time and how in the very, very old times, you know, people, marriages were arranged and there was no sense that, you know, there was anything but just uh, money or, you know, the appropriate person. And then in the 19th century, we had the romantic period where, you know, became this idea that you, you fall in love and that was a new idea. And this seems to be champion this idea that marriage maybe is more successful when people are friends. I mean, I'm talking about the William Powell, Myrna Loy friendship, which is admittedly, they, they have the means to be friends, <laughs> they, you know, the means to be do whatever they want. But it isn't like they're, you know, it's some kind of magnetism or it's more like they're just companionable like they are in The Thin Man. So I just thought that was interesting to me about marriage. Right. So throw that out. <laughs> Valerie? I always forget where to unmute the button. Um, I just, I thought it was interesting. Um, the whole, uh, when William Powell is fishing in the stream and he's an angler and wasn't he a, um, like a smooth operator. So like it's sort of a, a play on words or, or a metaphor. He's an angler fisherman, but he's also an angler mm -hmm. with people, with humanity too. And that's why Spencer Tracy taps him into him and brings him back on board to kind of solve this dilemma with uh, the, the, you know, the heiress and her father, which again, I think Maria uh, mentioned it happened one night. I thought it's the same dad who's, who's the millionaire and uh, it, it's the newspaper and we've got to, you know, do whatever we can to get that newspaper off our back kind of. And I don't know, it just seemed like, like you say, this type of genre, the screwball comedy really is uh, prevalent. I, I just finished watching a little off the topic, you know, Fred Astaire and uh, Ginger Rogers, which kind of, you know, it's the same opulent costuming and, you know, the mistaken identities and the back and forth. And I wonder in that time frame, you know, when so many people were out of work and there were the soup lines and the bread lines and, you know, where's, what are we doing next? that this was escapism, whether it really spoke to a reality or not, it's escapism and it was a place to go to forget your troubles. So anyway, enough said. <laughs> yes, please. You're talking to me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it just says iPad. So Wiles, Wilesers oh, iPad. Sorry. Yes. Maru. <laughs> Hi, Maria. Um, I'm... The thing I think that I came away with is that stays with me the most is the Spencer Tracy character and his total disregard for Gladys. I found it almost beyond belief that, but apparently, I mean, 
this this film was made a year before I was born, so that's how really old it is. And I thought, is that a, was that a an attitude that was acceptable at that period of time? Uh, I found, I mean, I love Spencer Tracy, and I've never seen him look so handsome as he does in this film. <laughs> but his character is totally. <laughs> off the wall. I, I just, I couldn't even like him because of the way he was totally disrespectful, disregarding, um, really so just self-absorbed that nothing else mattered. So that was another issue in the film for me. There's somebody. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to react to what you said and, and tie into it because um, the, the, the sexual politics of this film were just so outdated and a little <laughs> offensive to you know anyone who's watching today. And um, I guess my question is, is that like a totally irrelevant concern when watching a screwball comedy? I mean, are we, you know, is that the wrong lens to look through? I mean, should we just be escaping and laughing and not really relate to them as, as flesh and blood? Yeah, I think that's that's exactly my concern, right? But but, but, but in being in being so concerned about that, we're probably missing a lot. So as maybe Maria could comment on that a little. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to hear your reactions. Um, I don't I don't think you're missing a lot. I think you're getting the point. I'm I myself don't see these films as escapist. I think they're pointing out. Can't hear you, Maria. Can't hear me. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. I wonder what's going on. Um, I was I was saying I don't find these film escapist. Uh, I find that they're uh, actually sort of focusing on um, very kind of unsettled, sometimes disturbing patterns. We can't I want I don't know. I have it on as loud as I can get it. Is that better? You know, people could adjust the volume on their own computer too to make uh, the volume louder. Yeah. Yeah. Can most people hear me? I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay. For the third time, I'll say I don't think these films um, uh, are uh, escapist, and I think, in some sense, their central subject are sexual politics. Um, I think one of the one of the clues to help us sort of see how they're caricaturing the way men and women um, are somehow being coupled. Getting back to Sharon's point, get, getting coupled in the modern age. Um, I, I don't think this is meant to present to us uh, a kind of pristine way. It's it's not. It happened one night, which is in fact a very romantic film. Um, it even has a kind of moon, and you know, it's off in Tahiti. But the real gritty realism of that film has nothing to do with these kind of romantic illusions. Um, uh, you might remember at the very end, the, uh, the film just before the couples all get together, it's a carnival and you see Myrna Loy and William Powell posing in that kind of ridiculous sort of grotesque uh, uh, view. And to me, that's a kind of visual signal that we're dealing really with social types and their most sort of caricatured uh, kind of outsized uh, form. So I think in, in terms, that's why I said at the beginning, I think this film is asking what makes a marriage um, and also what makes an ideal heroine or hero. Um, I don't think either of the men, and I think Valerie is your, your point about angling is very well taken with William Powell. Um, that he is an angler. He's debonair, he's intelligent, he's subtle, um, but also he's a manipulator. He manipulates, uh, you know, it's not just Spencer Tracy. Everybody in some ways exploits Gladys. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I, and I, think we're, I think we're meant to, I think we're meant to sort of see that. And I think we're meant to sort of feel that. Or when Spencer Tracy says, um, he may, she may be, uh, uh, she may be his, his wife, but she's engaged to me. I think we have to sort of wonder what, what constitutes a marriage in, in, this, 
in this very sort of economically turbulent time, women are going out into the, into the workforce. Uh, women like Gladys are really kind of almost at the mercy of these men because in some sense they've been gulled by true, um, uh, sort of true magazine and true romance magazines. And even Myrna Loy, I mean, when she's first introduced to us, she's, she's I think a very chilly character. Um, and it's interesting, the only way they get together is when he, he does that little nice thing, oh, I didn't know you were so fragile, okay? I mean, she's snotty, she's smart, but she's snotty. So everybody has a long way to go before they are, I think, humanly ready for a relationship. Um, and I think, it, I think the really the human moment comes when you, you finally get the women paired in one room and the men paired in another, um, and you get a sense of how gender roles are starting to break down in the film. Uh, but it's only the Myrna Loy um, uh, 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 Harlow pairing uh, that seems to suggest a real, I don't know, a kind of real understanding, both a positive understanding, Myrna Loy sort of saying, you don't, you know, you don't really love him. You can't build a marriage on spite. But Gladys has her own kind of intelligence. And she says, you all think you, you know, you all think you're smarter than me. You all think, you know, you're all gearing up for your own happy ending, leaving me neglected on the side. And so I think the film through her is almost sort of protesting some of the sexual politic, political conventions um, that you find, um, uh, that find so, um, well, sort of, sort of disturbing. And they certainly make, make you kind of uneasy. Um, so the, the very charm of the stars, I think covers this over in a way, but I think uh, it's also the charm that allows us to sort of confront. I mean, if, if you did a melodrama of this, I'm not sure it would have the sort of same impact. You say, oh, it's a melodrama, but this is supposed to be a comedy and I think it registers in a different way. Um, just wanted to say, um, Oh yeah, well, the couple of things, but uh, uh, Harriet had a thing about the, the ethnic stereotypes. This is just a given in the film uh, and in the era. Um, it, uh, it, it's lamentable, um, but there, you know, there it is. There's no question about it. On the other hand, I think there's still things to be retrieved from these films that are a lot more savvy about gender relations, about uh, the status of women, um, about newspaper, about uh, uh, the divide between, you know, high and low or high, you know, heiresses and working girls, what it means to be a working person um, that I, I think are, 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 are I, at least to me, uh, seem to be very sort of cogent and, and even um, uh, resonant um, today. But I just want, I mean, so in other words, I don't think I don't think you're missing something. I think you're getting at something uh, that the film itself um, is, uh, is in some sense asking us. You can't make a film like this, a particular Jean Harlow, who is known as a sex bomb goddess, right? I mean, all her films, men are falling all over. You start a movie with somebody who is spending most of his time trying not to hook up with her. Right there is a signal that there's going to be a caricature. It's going to be a reversal of all the expectations you are bringing to sp screwball comedy, as if to say, what are the assumptions of comedy anyway? Um, and maybe we should examine those uh, those uh, those assumptions. So I hope. I mean, I hope just to. It's a kind of defense, but also just uh, uh, an affirmation of the kinds of reactions um, that se several of you have already um, voiced. Yes. I just wanted to, I saw that Harriet um, had made a comment and raised her hand. I saw Craig raised his hand and Nikki shared something on the comments. Harriet, did Maria address your question that you shared on the chat? Yes, it was about how white the film is. And that I don't know whether you could make a screwball comedy like that today. But the thing I see in the film about who gets top billing. These four stars would all get top billing. And what I see in terms of the women's characters is they stand toe to toe with the men and they are equals in the conversation. And they carry on important dialogue. It's not as though the male characters 
dominate the language or dominate the thematic material. The women also carry it on. Um, there's one scene that's actually adorable when a Spencer Tracy, uh, no, it's William Powell plays Jean Harlow a compliment and she says, you're not such a cluck yourself. I mean, this, this is a piece of very stylized dialogue and she pulls it off because she's capable of creating language that will come out of the movie and go into popular culture. That's and a also, great- In terms of the whiteness, um, the style designers, whenever they dress the women up, they put them in these flowing white satin gowns with white furs. I mean, they take white people, white women, and they dress them in white, ascribing to them a kind of virginity color, which they may or may not have, but that's the way they're going to be dressed. I'd be interested uh, if you come next week with the Lady Eve, because the whole moral associations with white and black, because these are black and white films, um, with the Barbara Stanwyck characters very much along those uh, along those lines. Um, so yeah, I mean, these films are very aware of every aspect um, of production, what they're wearing, how they're, you know, uh, how they how they look, how they walk, and uh, most importantly, of course, how they speak. Um, and I think it was, was it a sort of Nikki, um, Maureen Watkins was one, there are, three, there are three screenwriters for this, but the dialogue is really that sort of fast, snappy uh, uh, repartee going sort of back and forth. One of my favorite lines that, <laughs> that, uh, that Harlow has is after they get married and the preacher says to them, um, I, you know, I hope to, I hope to uh, celebrate your silver anniversary. And she says, well, it'll have to be in the next six weeks. <laughs> Um, and it sort of it just sort of come it sort of comes out and and the the back and forth. I mean, I also think that that's what probably um, uh, marks this as a film or or a genre that can't can't be made today, um, because the the dialogue is is, um, is is so sort of snappy and knowing and um, uh, and kind of um, kind of unafraid. Uh, I, I think now. Uh, I think you could you could make this film. This film actually was remade in 1946 with Esther Williams. Just dreadful. Uh, just called Easy to Wed. Just dreadful. The only good thing in the in the film is uh, Lucille Ball, uh, who plays something like the Gladys character. Not quite. Um, you could make it. You could make it even. With, you could make it with black actors, Latina. I mean, it doesn't. I I don't. I don't think. But I wonder if. Um, I don't know. Just just this the 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 instinct to speak up for yourself, to answer back. Um, I don't know if that's something in our, in our culture. Um, and so maybe our sexual politics have evolved in a certain way, but I think uh, in other ways, uh, perhaps um, their techniques, where she says, oh, he has techniques, their techniques or there's ways of, of presenting yourself in the world or standing up for yourself in the world, both for men and women um, that may not be, uh, you know, may not be quite as current or as available um, as they were in the 1930s, where people either have, you know spoke up for yourself, or you or you really didn't have a future. Again, that that opening I think is important is already signaling to us they kind of know their way forward, um, and they also bespeak a kind of pleasure in each other, um, uh, which especially in our own society um, <laughs> I think often comes in short supply. All right, um, I see questions from Craig and from Jack. Uh, we'll go Craig first, he had his hand up first, and then we'll go to you, Jack. Craig? Thank you. Uh, I, one of the scenes that I really loved was when it, when both uh, Myrna Loy and William Powell were swimming out to the, the, the house in the middle of a pond or lake. And I love that scene because it's the first time she really seems like a human, 
really like a uh, caring human being. And, and it's really where you can see that their, their interaction is so great. And it has the overtone of the audience knows that it's part of a setup. And so that just kind of whole adds to it. But I think that scene is really great. I also really liked the scene where it really, for me, became a screwball comedy when uh, William Powell is fishing and he's being pulled down the, the stream. And uh, it just, it, it reminded me, all I could think of was bringing up baby. It just looked so much like that classic screwball comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's that slapstick. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that's wonderful about Powell, he could be this kind of debonair man and, uh, in a uh, you know in white tie and then that fish every time I see that fishing scene I just I just burst out laughing I can't I can't help it um and and it just, the book goes down the river yeah, and yeah, how um, to fish yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's yeah. great mm -hmm. so it, it, he's not afraid as an actor even as a character to just sort of go go all out and that's what I mean by by a certain kind of um I don't know, unselfconscious, uh, unselfconsciousness, or sort of a, a total commitment um, of, of a of a character to his role, but I think an actor um, uh, to the to the person that he sort of created. Uh, also, if you, uh, I also um, wanted to point out that's a really important scene. It's an interlude. It's a nighttime scene. It's very sort of intimate, and um, it it does, as you say, Craig, suggest that she's becoming human and. The key to her humanity is her childhood, and that's going to that's going to be a kind of recurring theme in screwball mm -hmm. comedies. That in order to become an adult, you have to, in some sense, um, admit something of your childhood. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll encounter this in in the Lady Eve as well. But something about that interlude, um, I think, is really important, and also presents, as you say, the kind of moral choice for William Powell because it is a setup. Yeah. And it's that's when he kind of makes the you know that's when he obviously shifts allegiance um, and shows that there's another side of his personality outside of the arch manipulator. Jack, you had a question. Yes, I just wanted to go on record as saying I believe Maria makes a good case, but one that for me is unconvincing. Mm -hmm. I find that uh, she is overburdening. The, uh, the film with meanings and resonances, mm -hmm. it neither can su sustain nor in fact may have been intended. Makes for good discussion, but I'm not convinced. I, I rather focus on the things that give me pure enjoyment, which are the elegance of the film, its artifice, its great verbal felicity, mm -hmm. its pace, which is so wonderful with its repartee that is so beautifully sharp and, uh, and fast and chop chop. Uh, those are the things that uh, for me provide the great pleasure. And I think the, the, basic the basic intention of that work is to provide just pure enjoyment, escapism, through uh, the brilliance of the casting and the, and the uh, very, very good, nice uh, filmmaking. But uh, in terms of, once again, don't want to be repetitive, but I'm unconvinced that the, the film intends us to, uh, to see these kinds of resonances that may, uh, Maria is suggesting. Elizabeth? I'll respond to that. I'll take on Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. I would be curious to know a little bit more about, a little more about specifics of what you think are maybe laying too much on. Would you care to elaborate a little bit about that? I, well, the themes I think that Maria was attempting to unearth uh, they, they would have to do with the sexual politics, among other things. Um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's it. There's, uh, uh, yeah, 
I think that uh, Maria was talking a great deal about sexual politics. If I, if I'm giving a fair, uh, a fair rendering of of her remarks. Uh, John, you you wanted to add something? Sure, I wanted to. Uh, I think Jack's right in the sense that the delight of period films from the, from the '30s is how well they're made and. You know them as sort of an amusing uh, confection which we uh, enjoy and that's certainly true and that's you know in this in this case more uh, classically the uh, the Powell and Loy uh, part of the of the film but I disagree in the sense that I think the screwball comedy uh, by its nature is loaded with sexual politics now it may not be uh, you know, in the way we think of it today, and I don't think Maria is talking about it that way, but, you know, it's the classic battle of the sexes, which this period and screwball comedies did so well. And it's the way the, the male character and the female character kind of battle each other, you know, with their wits and you know where it's going to end up. Uh, um, although this ending is fun in the sense that it kind of mixes it around and leaves it but emotionally, it gets to the point where you want it to be, which is a resolution. So I think the idea of looking at this from a point of view of sexual politics is, is totally appropriate. But I also agree that um, I, it's interesting uh, and, and also unsettling in terms of the film, the, um, the, the Harlow and uh, Tracy subplot um i i didn't quite buy that uh, you know harlow is such a strong presence such a strong character as an actress and this character also is so brassy and assertive that it's kind of hard to believe that she's going to put up and so sexy uh that it's kind of hard to buy on the surface that she would allow herself to be pushed around as much as she is in the film. Um, but it's interesting to kind of think of that because it is a little bit different uh, from the way a normal screwball comedy goes. Um, but I think that's, it, it, there, it does have, an, an, uh, you're, when you go into a screwball comedy, you're expecting just to be delighted all the way. And it's kind of a, a minor note or an off note that you're hearing in that subplot, which I found interesting and agreed with Maria that it's, um, you know, that, it, that, that says a lot too about what, what's going on. Uh, just, it, may I respond to that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. If you really examined those aspects of women being victimized, if you really want to be realistic about it, exploited and victimized by these men, uh, pawns in their, uh, in their scheme. I mean, and, and you took all of those things seriously, the treatment of these women, uh, you, the, the film couldn't sustain itself. The film has to overlook all of those things. If it really examines what it's going on, it would be an unbearable film to tolerate at that time, that, that era, or this. It, it avoids doing that. It is all subsumed in the, sure, the, the elegance, the glamour, the fun of its entertainment, its froth. I don't consider it an examination of sexual politics to see that it's uh, men and women battling each other. That's been perennial from the beginning of time. Uh, it's really how deep you go in examining that battle, what's at stake, what's felt, the consequences of that. Then we're going beyond this genre of screwball comedy into something quite serious and complex, which this film couldn't sustain. It looks like Elizabeth wanted to comment and then Sharon. So yeah, re responding again to Jack, I, I, I think I feel where you're coming from. I, I enjoy this kind of film very much and I care about <clears throat> women's 
you know, equality in society as I think probably we, we, we all, I assume do. Um, but on another level, I do see it as an historical artifact, right? Like looking at a Shakespeare play, you mm -hmm. can see the sexual politics in that or in Chaucer or in George Eliot or anything, if Dickens, if you want to look for it, it's there everywhere, right? It's a question of whether that's what you want to focus on. And, and you can, I can focus on that and still in, enjoy it as well as frothy and beautiful, the sets, the costumes. Um, but, you know, it's 1936. And if we want to talk about the role of women in the film, let's think about the fact women in America had had the vote for only about 16 years at this point. And so women are kind of getting their feet under them in terms of political power. Women are starting to you know, run for office in greater numbers. We're on the eve of World War II, where we know that the role of women in America is going to change a lot um, because of the war in many ways. And so uh, it's a really interesting time in America for women. And I think I feel like I saw that in this movie in different ways with the two women prime primary characters because of their different levels of social class, we saw how much freedom the Myrna Loy character has uh, with regard to the Jean Harlow character uh, who is hell bent on getting married, presumably to a great extent for economic security. That was my assumption anyway. Um, and so I do think for me, that's part of sexual politics and also how it ties in with the socioeconomic realities of the time in America. And yet it's still, it's such enormous fun. And I had never seen this movie before, Maria, and it was, a, it was really fun. I can't wait to watch it again and possibly <laughs> again and again. Lady Eve is one of my all time favorite movies. And uh, so I look forward to that discussion, but, and that, seems to me a deeper film, but maybe I'll feel differently after I've seen this one more, more times. But anyway, thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sharon? Oh, yeah. I think, um, well, first of all, we can't really be like people of the 1930s to know exactly what they thought at the time. But from today and all through, you know, through the 60s and feminism and everything, we, we have had this... Um, this view of, of women, there are some women that are on the pedestal and then there are women that are only valued for their beauty, for their sexual attributes. And I think that's what this movie is also about, is almost two kinds of women. It's, it's a little bit different than the class thing because I mean, I, I don't think it's really just class that drives that. It's also um, power. I mean, whether somebody has power through money, which usually the Myrna Laurie character, she does, but she also has intellect, she has wisdom. And the, um, <laughs> losing it. The other character. Um, Gladys. Yeah, Gladys. She, <laughs> she, um, she has her, her sexual attraction, which is really, I mean, that's kind of why you feel that Spencer Tracy doesn't really ever bother with her, or give her this time of day, because, well, she's just a good, you know, she's a, She's an attractive lay for him <laughs> and he'll be, he'll be fine with her. You sort of wonder what the different marriages will be. You know, like if you had the reader I married him is like the end of the novel, but, but if you go on and then find out what it was really like, you know, you sort of have a sense that the, the Powell uh, Merloy marriage would, you know, those characters would be more successful and the Spencer Tracy and the, the Gladys uh, character would just be sort of, often sort of thrown into this, oh, well, I can't really talk to her anymore. She's just blabbing on and on about modern romance or something. You know, it's just, it's sort of an interesting, to me, it's, it's also bringing up that difference of the way men look at women, whether they're on a pedestal or they're just, you know, um, uh, looked after for their other attributes. That's all I'll say. Mute myself. <laughs> yes, Harriet. Somebody asked for the name of the scriptwriter, 
And I think you might have been, been able to call this movie Quartet because <laughs> the script that the writer gave to each of the four characters was very well balanced and they could exchange roles at any time and still not lose their balance in the story mm. development. And, and the movie, for me, regardless of power, politics is about language. And the language mm. the writer gives to all of the characters to keep them in quartet fashion, quartet role. And I, I did want to tell Craig that I liked the um, boat house scene also, because that was the moment when I thought William Powell's character revealed himself as not being an angler, but that he might want to care about Myrna Loy, when he might want to start protecting her. And I don't know what made me think of Gregory Peck's role in Roman Holiday oh. at that exact moment when the newspaper reporter decides to give up his role as an investigative reporter and protect his story source. And that was the turning point for me in the William Powell character when something happened to him when he wasn't going to be just an angler. And there are turning points for each of the characters where they, they flip their role a bit. But um, Maria, I, I think the film is about language. Uh. A linguistics professor would have a great time with this film. Can I just uh, also ask something here? Sure, Maria. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I put a question in uh, a bit back, and it is related to this notion of what John raised about the the uh, seriousness or the you know lightheartedness of the film. And when I first watched, this is the first time I've watched it, and I thought it was you know in the tradition of screwball comedy, except for the fact that I was so distressed about Spencer Tracy's character. But then as we've started discussing this, it occurred to me, and I don't want to get into a big discussion about the intentional fallacy, but I do want to ask about the writers and the director. I mean, if we see, if some of these things were using comedy as traditionally comedy has been used over the centuries to actually critique social issues, okay? they must have known what they were doing. And I just wondered if, if Maria or anybody else knew anything about who they were and what their careers in this kind of um, tradition were. Well, I, I mean, I think you're right, Maria, that um, obviously a screenplay that is this literate and witty um, is, is written by uh, writers who are very aware, not only of the language of the time, it's, it's very idiomatic, it's very modern, it's not, um, it's not in fact Broadway. Like, right, right, right. It's not particularly high diction of, of the sort. You feel that this is the language that men and women were speaking. I think the opening shot of the newspaper gives you a sense of this kind of a sort of bold, brassy headlines. So from the very beginning, it's interested in language, what language can do, the misuse of language. For, it actually can libel people. Okay, good, yeah. Uh, but more important, and most of these writers actually either came from Broadway or they were very much uh, versed by 1936. Um, first of all, when talkies came in, there was just, it was, it was like Hollywood became voracious for writers who knew how to sort of produce screenplays um, because they all of a sudden had to have actors who actually had to say something on the screen, not just, you know, um, uh, not just kind of emote or, or wildly gesticulate. Um, and it's, it, it's always been my fascination with not only how quickly did the movies learn how to talk, 
but just how fast, um, uh, just how fast the actual dialogue was. And um, Harriet, I think your point not, is not only fast, but it's it's very um, again coming back to this sort of very uh, witty. It's very sharp. Um, there's a sense of there is something almost musical, quartet-like. Uh, that, that yeah, you're, exactly. you're, you're hearing you're hearing almost sometimes a kind of oratorio. That's why I think the ending, where everyone is sort of speaking in this kind of discordant way, you can't sort out. That's not harmony. Normally, comedies end in a harmonic key. Okay, I mean, I suppose one of the ways to think about it, if you know uh, it happened one night when the trumpet is. Uh, the trumpet is play. There's a kind of musical keynote that a consummation has been reached and the end of comedy, in, in fact, has been achieved. Um, so comedy, uh, both, I mean, this goes back to classical comedy, certainly Shakespearean comedy. These writers actually were well-versed in just the kind of popular arts of comedy and know that comedy is used. And uh, uh, Jack, I actually don't see a contradiction between um, something being very well made, elegant, even frothy in its appearance, seemingly um, interested only in surface elegance. And um, uh, I don't know if, I don't even know if intention is the right word. It generates a social critique. That's what comedy does. Um, if, you, if you see a Shakespeare comedy, if you see a restoration comedy, if you see a comedy, uh, even comedies today, Comedies take place in a social milieu. Society has rules at conventions. It apportions roles. It assigns or dictates values. And comedy is a genre which allows you to examine, you could say sort of examine or represent these um, values, these conventions, these roles um, in a way that is more disarming than tragedy or melodrama or, uh, you know, kind of heavy, um, I call them sort of uh, heavy movies that have a, a design on your conscience. Um, I think comedies, in fact, are more effective in making you sort of question um, things that perhaps you took for granted. Um, and what I like about this comedy, it's not a perfect comedy. And, I, and um, uh, Elizabeth, I, I agree with you. I think Lady Eve is just uh, uh, much, uh, it, it's, a, it's a superior work. Um, is also work that was written and directed by the same man. So there's more sort of control about sort of what is going on and it goes a little bit deeper, but I still would contend um, that the very fact that so many of you had these kind of uh, very uh, striking, very uneasy at times, um, very sort of firm reactions, either of delight uh, or perplexity shows that the comedy is doing its work. Um, it's, it's putting the material out there. It's linguistically, uh, to get to, to Harriet's work, it's linguistically in some sense getting, you know, getting inside your head, sort of suggesting these people are sort of smart, what's going on? Making you sort of question the kinds of relationships um, that it's asking you to sort of observe. And I'm not saying everybody walks away from this movie, either in the 1930s or even sees it now, is going to in some sense, um, uh, take to the streets or, or sign a petition. Um, but I, I do think that the film itself is extremely aware of what it's doing, the way it's manipulating the reputation of its stars, the ways it's using established conventions of comedy and of the social issues that uh, it's, it's treating. Um, you know, the film at the end, essentially you have a bigamous pair. Bigamy is, is an issue. When you think about bigamy, what, if, what, what does it mean marriage? Why does the comedy begin with a Spencer Tracy character who's looking for every way to avoid a marriage? What is it about Jean Harlow that wants to get married? I think this is important. To me, one of the key moments in the film, which actually marks a term, time where she turns around is when she realizes that William Powell had that key all along and didn't use it, okay? And there's a close up on her and just in that moment, you see, this is a woman who has been fighting off men all her life. She just expects it. And one of the words, one of the key words throughout the film, and it's actually on that, um, it actually occurs, Craig, in that, that scene you like so much uh, between Myrna Loy and William Pell on the raft, when she says, I, sh I was wrong to be suspicious of you. 
In fact, she wasn't wrong. She was absolutely right. Um, and he said, no, and, and, and she in some sense is, you know, in some sense condemning morally herself for being, you know, maybe too fragile and, and, and too paranoid. She turns out to be right. I'm not saying, you know, that we're going to make, a, um, you know, a, a philosophical indictment about the position of women and when, why are they suspicious? Why do they need to be suspicious either on class grounds or on sexual ground? But there's, there's a lot of, um, I would say, justified cause to be wary in this film if you are, if you are female. Um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think in some ways this goes against um, the sort of comic momentum. I think it's what fuels it. And I think it gives it um, a kind of energy um, and I don't know, I don't think depth is the word, but I think, I think yeah, resonance. Um, I, I think it, it just strikes enough chords to get back to this music, it strikes enough chords to make us wonder what is it actually we're hearing and responding to? Not everybody is going to actually go that far and analyze it or think about it. Um, but once you do, I don't think those questions can, can be swept away. I don't think it's, you can treat them like Gladys and just sort of leave them on the table. I think they're there, and I think you have to. I think you have to confront them, um, and I think you can confront them without, in some sense, negating the very real fact um, that this is a very enjoyable, very well-made, elegant um, comedy by four actors at their peak. I just wanted to say I saw one question I could answer very quickly. That um, this is, you know, Myrna Loy started off her career as a uh, basically as an exotic. Um, she played all kinds of, um, she played the daughter in Fu Manchu, and she was always a kind of oriental or murderous or something, or um, there's, a, there's a film called The Animal Kingdom where she plays a very chilly heiress, um, very manipulative, but it was a Thin Man movies, which you saw last week, I think it's 1934, which paired her with Powell. Um, and the minute, she, again, she's introduced in a slapstick mode, this very elegant woman, she comes careening through that bar. Um, uh, that, that pairing just really took, they made 14 films together. This is maybe around the fourth or fifth they made, uh, made together. Um, and, uh, and the non-Thin uh, uh, Man movies, there's always, there's always a kind of meditation about why this couple is together. I think that's what comedies are about. What brings people together? What keeps them together or what drives them apart? And a lot of the films in the 1930s are really about not only how marriages are made but how marriages are often um, unmade. Um, uh, uh, a lot of attention to divorce because this is something socially is going on. There's more, there's more freedom to marry and divorce. Um, Gladys actually has three or four names in the film. Um, in the end, uh, she's Mrs. You know, is she Mrs. William Chandler? Is she Mrs. Stewart? Did she get her divorce or not? The whole plot, actually, uh, in some sense, hinges on Gladys's marital status. That's a fact, and um, it's a fact that makes the comedy go. It's the same thing that also makes the 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 comedy um, a little trickier than just saying it's pure entertainment. Yeah, I had uh, one person here, Nikki, who has commented twice uh, asking, and I think this ties in with the question um, about the scripting process and how well it was written. I know in a lot of our modern comedies, there's a lot of improvisation, yeah. um, but were the actors um, in the physical comedy portions or in the dialogue giving any freedom to improvise or was all of this yeah. uh, strictly written? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I really don't... I, there's some directors um, like Leo McCary who would allow, um, and Gregory Lakava, which would allow a lot of improv. If you know Stage Door, there's a lot of improv. It's mainly about women, uh, women actresses. Um, my my feeling is I, I haven't looked at this. I haven't looked at the script and I, and I haven't researched it that much. My feeling is that Powell was given a little leeway in how he was going to do that. The fishing scene when he falls into the stream because that's physical comedy. You have to sort of do what your body tells you. Um, but I think with Harriet, I, I, don't think, I don't think the dialogue was improvised. Um, I, think, I think the pace was too fast. Um, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the way the lines had to intersect and connect with each other suggests that in fact, um, 
there, there was very little improv. And you can actually sort of see it in the way the lines are delivered. There, there's no kind of naturalistic acting where you, you kind of uh, see an actor fall into a line. Uh, you feel that there's a, there's a kind of uh, really staccato rhythm all the way through. And that has to be orchestrated. Jack, you wanted to add one other comment? Yeah. I wanted Maria to know I couldn't agree more with the point she was making about many, many classic and great comedies mm -hmm. in terms of their very deliberate examination of uh, sexual politics. Mm -hmm. So from Aristophanes, through Moliere, through Shakespeare, through Coward, but in those cases, it's a very conscious and deliberate creation of works that are deliberately examining those things uh, through, again, a very frothy, light, uh, delightfully verbal artifice. But it's a very conscious examination of those themes, mm -hmm. something that I don't find is being done in this particular film. What this film reveals to me more than anything is what an audience it seems the majority of the audience at that time would accept without question, would not find terribly uncomfortable. Whereas so many of us are finding it very, very comfortable since we're looking at this film from 2020, not the late 30s or, four, or 40s. And that is uh, just as you said, when someone in our group brought up the offensiveness as we would now see it, of the racial stereotypes in the casting of black actors. And you said, well, that's just a given. And I think that's also true of the way we see women treated here in relationship of, 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 to men and the way men treat them. It's simply a given of the convention and style, not, not an examination of it. So, thank you. So I just wanted to say that I am very happy that this is a two part seminar and that uh, Maria has picked um, another great film for us to continue this conversation and digging things in next week. Um, we are a little over an hour now. Um, and again, we, we do have a conversation next week um, to dig into. Um, I, I think at this point, I'd like to just pause our conversation unless uh, anyone has any objections to that. Um, so that we can pick this back up and dig in uh, with the Lady Eve next week. Maria, I'll leave you the parting word. Anything you'd like to say to send us out? No, I just uh, thank you. I mean, it's really, it's, it's been a terrific evening. I appreciate your all coming and being very sort of direct and honest. And I look forward to getting your reactions to the Lady Eve. And we'll continue our conversation about comedy, language, women, pleasure. <laughs> and so enjoy and then be well. And good to Thank see you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good night, Chris.